Hello everyone. Welcome to this session of Environment and Ecology. Uh, good evening, Seema. All right. So uh, we are moving on to the twelfth lecture in this series, where we will be looking into uh, you know some more new topics, some miscellaneous topics. Okay, uh, not anything in particular, but we will be looking into some very important miscellaneous topics as such. So. Uh, welcome to Madhav Shankar classes. If you are new here, please make sure to subscribe to this channel and, uh, you know, uh, so that all my notifications will be, uh, you know, updated at the US side also. And please do like this video and share with your friends. Okay. So that they can also benefit from all these classes. Okay. So. Yeah, sorry for that. So, uh, without any further ado, let's begin today's session on environment and ecology. Okay, so I am Madhav Shankar Arbariya. Welcome once again to Madhav Shankar classes. So, today we are going into going to start with a topic known as animal diversity in India. Before I begin this topic, let me tell you, uh, it's very important that you study some of the important animals, birds and plants uh, in Indian conditions, especially the ones in the critically endangered list. Okay, critically endangered animals, plants, uh, birds, etc, etc. Also the mam mammals, important mammals. Please do take a list of them and uh, you know, study about each of them. Very, very, very important. Okay, so there's a long list. You can simply Google it and you can easily find the, uh, you know, the whole list of critically endangered animals and plants in India. Download that, study that. Okay, their location, their specific features, etc, etc. Okay, critically endangered and if possible endangered also. Endangered, you, you have a you know, comparatively longer list. So, uh, it will take some time to study. But anyway, if possible, study them as well. Critically endangered and endangered. Other categories, not so much important. Unless they appear in the news. In the current affairs section. Okay, so let's begin. Animal diversity of India. So let's start with some important key terms. As I told you, there is no proper structure or anything in this class. We are looking at into very random topics and, uh, you know, we will make some short ideas about each of these topics. Okay. So what exactly are marsupials? Marsupials are, you know, the best example is kangaroo. Correct. These are pouched mammals. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. You have all seen uh, at least a picture of a kangaroo. Basically, these are pouched mammals. Okay, so why do or why are they adapted in such a way? Because they have a placenta that is very short lived. Human beings and all other mammals, we have, uh, you know, the, the female mammals have a placenta. Correct. And in that placenta, the embryo is, you know, grown and they, they are, it, it is nourished and it go, grows into a fetus, etc, etc. And finally, after a long gestation period, they give birth. Correct. But as for marsupials, this is not the case. Although they have a placenta, they are very, very short lived. The placenta is very, very short lived. Okay. So that does not provide much nourishment to the fetus. So they give birth at a very, very early stage. For human beings, you know, the gestation period is like 10 months. Correct. But for marsupials, it's actually very, very low. So what happens? The, you know, they give birth at an early stage, but still that young one needs a lot of nutrition. So they climb up to the mother's, uh, from the mother's birth canal to their nipples. Okay. And then they, you know, uh, uh, they grab into the mother and, you know, continues with the mother and develop uh, in the pouch. Okay. Rather than going out, they continue for a, in the pouch for a very long time and, you know, get nourishment, nourishment from the mother. Correct. So the best examples are uh, kangaroo, wallaby, etc, etc. There are some extinct marsupials also like marsupial quagga and marsupial wolf. Okay, so these are about marsupials. Not too much, but just understand what this term is and uh, what is the reason why, uh, you know, the pouch is there. Alright, now another topic, migration. Migration is a topic that we already saw in some of our previous classes, 
especially regarding terrestrial ecosystem and pollution. So I hope you remember what migration is. Basically, migration refers to the regular, recurrent and cyclical seasonal movement. So it always happens. It's very regular. It's recurrent. Okay, keeps on happening and it's very cyclical, which means when the migration happens, when the when a bird migrates, it always come back to come back to the initial uh, area, initial region. Okay, when the climate is back, say for example, some birds such as Siberian crane and all, they migrate during the winter. Okay, but once that season is you know replaced by say summer or something, that bird comes back. Okay, so it is a cyclical event. It's a circular event. Some of the birds migrate to a short distance. Some of them migrate long distances such as Arctic tern and all which basically migrates, you know, Arctic tern is the longest migratory bird. Okay, but the main idea is that it is a cyclical process. So the bird comes back to the original place. But why do they migrate? What are the reasons for migration? Plenty of reasons are there. First of all, avoid adverse factors, especially climatic conditions. You know how the climatic conditions are there in Siberian region and all. Extremely unfavorable for, uh, you know, any kind of life. So to avoid adverse climatic conditions, birds migrate. Manage food shortage. Sometimes, you know, uh, certain areas where they live may have, you know, uh, the, the food source might be becoming very, very low. Okay, so they go to some other places for food. And once the food in the first area replenishes, they come back. To manage shortage of water. Yes, especially during summers or drought seasons they go in search of water and you know when the rainy season is back they come back to have a better breeding condition yes not all climatic factors are favorable for reproduction so breeding conditions are also you know one of the reasons why they migrate and last less competition for safe nesting places yeah sometimes due to the overpopulation or maybe due to the existence of a predatory species it might be very dangerous to create nesting places in a particular region. So they go move to some other place to avoid this extra competition or danger. Okay, so these are the usual reasons for migration of birds. Correct. So another topic, species extinction. We In yesterday's class, we talked about the different IUCN classifications of, you know, a variety of, uh, you know, based on the threat levels, extinct, extinct in wild, critically endangered, endangered, correct. I hope you remember all that. So extinction can happen due to two or in two processes. First of all, deterministic process. Second, stochastic process. Okay, so what are these? Deterministic process means these processes have a cause and effect. Okay, so for example, glaciation. You remember the ice age, correct? Ice age led to the extinction of animals like mammal, uh, mammoths. Okay, mammoths, etc. were extinct because of the ice age. Correct? So glaciation is a cause. Human interference such as deforestation is a cause. So because of this cause, there is an effect. And that effect is the extinction of a particular species. So this cause effect thing is known as deterministic processes. Second one is stochastic, stochastic processes. These are, you know, by chance, very random events. For example, unexpected changes in weather patterns. Okay, it might, you know, uh, suddenly a drought occurred or suddenly a flood occurred. Or maybe decreased food supply, some sort of a disease. Okay, you have heard about bird flu and all, correct? Swine flu, bird flu. Once this occurs, a huge number of its population vanishes and may eventually you know cause extinction or maybe increase in competition or the predatorial species or a parasitic species correct so these are the stochastic processes they are very random by chance events which could lead to extinction correct so the ecologists and scientists they have identified the traits that adversely affect or increases species vulnerability to extinction uh, due to habitat fragmentation. Okay, they have identified certain, uh, say, characteristics that can 
possibly lead to extinction okay based on their habitat fragmentation so what are these characteristics that could you know potentially pave a way for extinction first of all rarity or low abundance or poor dispersal ability okay if the number of individuals in that population is very low this could potentially lead to extinction very obvious second ecological specialization and unstable population again if that population is specific to certain ecological features then if that habitat is under threat then there is a very good chance that this species will get wiped out because they will be very poor in adapting to some other ecological conditions high tropic status this is another issue at high tropic status or at higher tropical levels the number of individuals is very low correct you know, i hope you remember the different tropical levels so in a food chain or a yeah in a typical food pyramid or something like that in a tropical pyramid here we have grass or say the producers then we have the primary consumers then secondary then tertiary and in certain cases quaternary correct so as we move up the numbers will obviously be very very less also since higher tropic levels depend on the lower tropical levels any kind of fluctuation or any kind of uh, you know danger to a lower tropical level will automatically affect the higher tropical level okay so that is another potential cause of extinction low intrinsic rate population increase yes reproduction rate might be very very low in certain cases okay so that could possibly lead to extinction body size uh fecundity dietary speci specializations etc etc i mean basically the you know uh the biological characteristics of that organism okay it, this could be anything this could be you know uh, dietary specification etc this depends on species we cannot generalize everything okay certain species uh, you know based on their body size their food their you know uh, dietary specializations etc etc uh, can you know potentially lead to extinction because of these factors uh, because of the absence or say, uh, say over exploitation of these factors it's a general point okay so these are the identified potential causes of extinction now there are two forms of extinctions uh, based on how extinctions are caused first of all natural extinction then artificial extinction natural extinction you know caused by natural factors such as continental drifting climate change tectonic activity increased volcanic activity so you know natural causes so as far as natural extinctions are concerned ecologists have found out that extinction in vascular plants has been much more gradual compared to the loss of animals so plant extinction is very gradual compared to animal extinction animal extinction is much more on spot very rapid compared to plants okay and usually plant extinctions are triggered by climatic change okay or say some competitive displacement so these are very gradual it doesn't happen overnight that is why plant extinctions are very very gradual but animal extinctions are not like that it's much more you know uh, uh, rapid mainly because they are animals usually occur at very high tropic level and their numbers are already very low okay moving on artificial extinction artificial extinction means what man made okay because of human contributions uh this extinction is triggered and here also we can subdivide it into two direct causes and indirect causes direct causes means human beings you know directly uh, target that killing of that animal for hunting purpose for collection persecution capture whatever these are direct causes indirect causes means because of human actions uh maybe habitat is lost maybe there is some modification in the environment okay maybe some invasive species have arrived into the scene so these are indirect causes we are not actually hunting that particular animal but because we have changed or manipulated some other factors these animals are getting affected these animals or plants are getting affected 
Okay, so this is the two subdivisions of artificial extinction. Yeah. Okay. Now, another very important topic, man-animal conflict. When you study this, please go and look into the MAB concept, man and biosphere concept. We will look, study this later, but it would be good if you uh, check it out as far as soon as possible. All right. So what exactly is man-animal conflict? This is something that we hear in newspaper every day. Okay, elephants came into the farmland and stormed the entire area and destroyed everything. Or leopard came into the cattle ranch and you know took away oxes and uh, you know cows and all. Okay, so we hear about all these you know man versus animal kind of conflict that exists, especially in the border regions to the forests. Correct. So what is the reason for all this? Why do man-animal conflict occur? Plenty of causes are there. Human population growth. Population growth has been accelerating over the years. Correct. We have overpopulation, population explosion. So in order to compensate or in order to provide for this such large numbers, obviously we have to encroach into, you know, uh, new and new uh, lands. Okay, we have to encroach into virgin lands. We have to cut down forests. We have to convert a lot of forest land into agricultural lands. We have to, uh, you know, convert a lot of water, uh, say wetlands into agricultural lands. Correct. So that is one issue. Land use transformation. Yes, just as I mentioned, converting a one potential land into something else. Species habitat loss, degradation and fragmentation. Yeah. Degradation, fragmentation. As I have mentioned, we had you know huge tracts of certain you know say agricultural land. We then divide it into small small fragments. This causes huge issues in the agricultural sector. And to increase production, we add more and more chemicals, or say we encroach into new lands, which could be a forest land or something. All these facilitate man-animal conflict because these are territories of animals. When you use more and more chemicals, what happens? Microorganisms and you know soil bacteria and such uh, you know rodents etc etc will get affected. The food chain will get affected because of bioaccumulation and biomagnification. All this leads to conflict between human beings and animals. Increasing livestock populations and competitive exclusion of wild herbivores. Yes, but when the you know there is increasing livestock population, what happens? There is competition. Correct. Competition is there. Also, because we have encroached into the forests, and because uh, you know in the forests, uh, you know there is more number of uh, carnivores animals. They always come and feed on herbivores uh, who are abundant in the forest uh, border lines, border areas. Growing interest in ecotourism and increasing access to nat natural reserves. Yeah. Eco in the name of ecotourism, we go into the homes of uh, animals and plants. Correct. We are encroaching into the forests. It's okay to go into to go there and you know uh, enjoy the nature and all, but we also you know cause huge issues there. Correct. We make that place entirely polluted. Uh, you know due to the unscientific construction, etc., etc. This will lead to you know huge threats to the habitat for that animal. So it has no alternative but to migrate to some other place which could actually lead to a human territory. Abundance of abundance and distribution of wild prey. Increasing wildlife population as a result of conservation programs. Yes. Climatic factors, stochastic events, example in the fire, etc. etc. So all uh, these are self-explanatory. Okay. So all these together, or say uh, you know, individually, are the reasons of man animal conflict okay so what are the impacts because of this conflict what is the impact as for human beings crop damage livestock depredation injuries to people loss of life damage to property and what about animals injuries injurious you know to wildlife animal deaths destruction of their habitats correct so both parties are affected in a negative way. So what can we do to prevent all these things? 
plenty of recommendations are made by different different committees etc etc over the years some of the important ones artificial and natural barriers okay so one of the uh, interesting idea is to create some sort of a barrier artificial barrier means what for example electric fence this is an artificial barrier it itself is a you know danger to animals but this is one of the things that are proposed and was implemented but uh, unfortunately we have heard about elephants being electrocuted etc etc because of the higher voltage uh, in these artificial fences another uh, natural barriers include say rivers okay or a water channel in between the forest and the uh, you know human territory similarly guarding guard posts alternative high cost livestock husbandry practices relocation waste management systems that restrict wildlife access to refuse yeah this is another reason we you know often collect all the garbage and dump into some area this attracts wildlife into that area for you know food if we can prevent this if we can scientifically dispose of this waste then that could prevent a huge lot of conflict between animals and man correct you have seen street dogs the main reason the street dogs the number of street dogs are increasing and they are causing all this trouble is because we simply throw away the waste here and there so the street dogs you know feed on these wastes and their population will grow and when the uh, source becomes you know uh, less and less they starts to become more and more irritated agitated and will cause conflict with the human beings correct mitigative strategies what are the mitigative strategies again think about it you can write all these by yourselves compensation systems some sort of a compromise system if we are taking x amount of forest land for human purposes then animal the animal kingdom or the uh, the uh, that biota should be adequately compensated insurance programs this is for human beings also okay when human uh, the farm lands or crop lands are devastated by animals that human the farmer should also be adequately compensated by some governmental schemes insurance programs yeah we have insurances for farm lands and all also for human life incentive programs in order to you know adapt more and more measures that could prevent this man animal conflict community based natural resources management schemes this is a particular scheme you know a set of schemes implemented by the government try this you know check this out in the internet plenty of schemes are there more are being added every day so basically all these schemes aims to uh, you know bring in community participation in managing these natural resources so that this man animal conflict can be avoided regulated harvest yeah you can have you know uh, harvest your crops at a particular time before it attracts wildlife okay say for example mangoes if you allow the mango to ripen in the mango tree then that would attract birds you know bats and all these kinds of things but if you you know pluck it out while it is still raw then you know by adjusting that harvest season you can actually uh, avoid a lot of conflict increase alternate crops praise or water points yeah by increasing the number of alternate crops animals are get, getting a alternate choice correct so the uh, the primary source of attraction will be changed to that one thereby human beings we can protect the main crop wildlife translocation yeah especially in case of you know animals such as tigers and lions it's better that you relocate that animal into some other forest a deeper forest or a, you know in the same forest into a deeper area conservation education for local population yes better sharing of information yeah obviously so these are the some uh, some of the these are some of the potential mitigative strategies you can add your own points you know original points to this to make it more attractive but you know these are some of the you know broader areas in which you can think you can bring in more scientific and more technological uh, mitigative measures into this okay use so using of drones using of wildlife cameras all these can be added okay use you know uh, 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 bringing in the participation from tribal people uh, bringing in participation from the you know mountain people all these can be added as you know your own original points to the mitigative strategies so that is about the animal diversity in india now we are looking into the plant diversity 
remember once again i am telling you it is essential that you learn about uh, the uh, critically endangered and endangered animals and plants and birds in india okay i mean the entire the full list is very large in a world perspective but in india it's possible for you to uh, you know look through them the number of critically endangered species is comparatively very low endangered species it's a bit more but still at least read through them four or five times so that when that name comes in the answer paper in the options you will be able to remember at least you know you will have some idea where that animal is whether whether they are critically endangered or endangered or if it is some other category all right so plant diversity in india so what are the plant classifications this is a very simple chapter most of the things in this chapter you have already studied in biology upper primary or high school classes okay very simple chapter so i'll be moving a bit fast what is a herb what are herbs plant whose stem is always green and tender and their height does not exceed 1 meter such plants are known as herbs okay you know all these medicinal herbs tulsi all these are examples of herbs what is a shrub they have woody perennial stem okay so they differ from the perennial herb because they have a woody stem it's not a tender always green kind of stem it differs from a tree because it has a low stature and its habit of branching from the base okay in case of a tree the tree will branch only at its peak correct at a very high uh, you know area in its crown but for a shrub the branching happens at a very lower area itself and they will become you know some sort of a mini kind of tree usually the height limit is 6 meters and for a tree trees are what large woody perennial plants having a single well defined stem with more or less defined crown what is crown this branch and leaves together that area is known as crown so these are the broad classifications of plants okay but there are some more classifications uh, based on their i know method of nourishment okay or their association with other plants one is parasite what is a parasite you already know parasites are those organisms that live on a host organism for their nourishment correct they might live on it or they might one way or another they will feed on another organism for their nourishment okay so the, some of them they grow on some living plant called host and penetrate their suckling roots called hostoria into the host plant okay the suckling roots which actually pulls out the nourishment or sucks out the nourishment from the host plant such roots are known as hostoria so based on their activity or based on how much they depend on the host plant they can be divided into two one is total parasite which means the full nourishment is taken from the host plant second is partial parasite which means partly the nourishment is drawn from the host plant the remaining is you know made by itself or maybe through other processes now epiphytes what are epiphytes i have already mentioned what are epiphytes in one of my previous lectures i hope you remember them basically plant growing on the host plant but not nourished by the host plant these are known as epiphytes epiphytes have aerial roots okay so they actually you know use uh, use the support of a tree etc for you know for support that's it they do not depend on that tree for nourishment it's just for support you know because of some reasons they might not get say for example sunshine so they have to move all the way up to get some sunshine so they will use that tree as a support but they will produce their you know their own food and all so instead of sucking the nutrients from the tree or sucking the water from the tree they have this aerial roots which are capable of absorbing moisture from the air okay so such plants are known as epiphytes then climbers you all know what a climber is they also have all these things again the main idea is that they you know uh, cl uh, they cling on to the tree and they move all the way up for say sunlight etc etc okay some of the climbers have aerial roots and some have other attachments okay now 
Effects of abiotic components on plants. So our ecosystem is made of both biotic components and abiotic components. So these abiotic components, I think I have mentioned abiotic components basically determines what kind of biota grows in that area. Okay, so what are the effects of abiotic components on plants? First of all, intensity of light. So how does a plant get affected by the intensity of light? Extremely high intensity favors root growth than shoot growth. Okay, if it's extreme high intensity light, then the root will grow much, much, much better than the root, uh, than the shoot. The height of the shoot will be very, very low and it will be stunted. Best example, desert, cactus. Okay, very high intensity light. So the, uh, the root system is very well developed, but the shoot is very, very low. Increased transpiration. Yes, short stem. Yes, smaller, thicker leaves. Yes, low intensity of light. Okay, th these are the you know uh, adaptations to high intensity light. Now, low intensity of light retards growth, flowering and fruiting. That is also obvious. If the light intensity is very low, what happens? Photosynthesis does not take place adequately, which means the nourishment of the plant or the food producing capacity of the plant is inhibited. So naturally the growth also retards. This will affect its reproduction, fruiting, etc, etc. Okay. Now, when the light intensity is less than the minimum, okay, even less than the minimum, the plant ceases to grow completely. Okay, and it starts to accumulate carbon dioxide. Okay, I mean, if the photosynthesis is not taking place, what will happen? The carbon dioxide being absorbed does not get converted into uh, food and oxygen. Correct? So, accumulation of carbon dioxide happens and eventually the plant will die. Okay, out of all the colors in a natural spectra, I mean, white light or sunlight, when passed through a prism, produces seven colors, correct? The Vibgior. Out of these seven colors in the visible spectrum, only red and blue are effective for photosynthesis. The remaining five does not uh, affect any kind of photosynthesis. Okay, only red and blue are useful for plants in terms of photosynthesis. Plant grown in blue light are small. Red light results in elongation of cells. These are extra points that you can keep in mind. If a plant is grown in blue light, then the growth is very much uh, standard. But if a plant is grown in red light, then there is elongation of plant cells, which means you know it results in an elongated kind of uh, system, plant system. And plants grown in ultraviolet light or violet light, they are dwarfs, dwarf plants. Okay, if the plants are grown in ultraviolet, I mean ultraviolet means beyond the visible spectrum. Correct. And violet. Violet is within the visible spectrum, but in the edge. Correct. At the lower edge. So if this happens, then the plant will be a dwarf. Okay. So these are the effects of intensity of light on growing plants. As for effect of frost, how does frost play in the plant's life? Basically, when frost occurs, the soil, the top soil is frozen. Correct. Think about permafrost in the Siberian region, Arctic region, in the taiga kind of ecosystem. Okay. So, the freezing of soil moisture. When this happens, obviously, the roots will not be able to absorb water, which means the plant is not getting adequate water. So, what happens? They will die. Transpiration will exceed absorption of water and they will die. Okay, so the death of the plant due to damage to cells, this also can happen. Okay, one way of dying is, you know, because of not adequate water. The other way in which the plant might die is because of the death of the plant due to damage to the cells. The intercellular spaces will get frozen. Okay, and what happens when water freezes? It expands. Correct. So that expansion can ruin the intercellular structures 
and you know this can also cause increasing concentration of salts and dehydration of cells eventually resulting in death of plant the plant will you know start to grow some kind of ulcer okay i mean you can see the clearly see certain uh, some kind of a uh, you know uh, say discoloration or some sort of you know, ulcer like thing in the plant uh, stem and all these are known as cankers okay so formation of cankers is also associated with the effect of frost on plants then comes effect of snow so snow and frost are different frost basically freezes the top soil snow is more like a extra layer over the top soil okay any questions no so i'm continuing uh so snow snow acts as a blanket okay snow can actually prevent further drop in the temperature that is also correct snow basically acts as a blanket in the soil and that inherent temperature is kept as such it doesn't go, you know fall further down and this can actually protect seedlings from excess cold and frost that is true another influence of snow is basically the mechanical bending of tree stem okay the stem of the tree because of the weight of the snow can actually bend to a huge extent in certain cases it breaks in that case it, the tree dies but otherwise this bending is another influence of snow now temperature how does temperature affect the growth of a plant excessive high temperature results in death of a plant due to coagulation and protoplasmic proteins yes excessive temperature means what excessive transpiration which means huge loss of water and if that is not compensated by adequate absorption what will happen coagulation will happen in the protopl protoplasmic levels and this will result in huge salt concentrations and eventual death of plant okay now dieback what is a dieback dieback is one of the adaptation mechanisms that we see in a lot of plants where the plant will start dying from its extremities okay so first you will see some of the leaves starting to discolor then the leaves starts falling off and then you know from the ends of that plant slowly slowly it comes to the middle and finally you know some of the branches is gone and you know then the main stem and finally the roots so it is a reverse death process get it that is why it is known as dry dieback okay the root will be still alive for a lot of years but the shoot will die completely and this is very commonly seen in trees like sal red sanders etc etc usually the causes for this dieback are as follows firstly dense overhead canopy and inadequate life uh, light especially happening in equatorial rainforests where there is huge you know multiple layers of canopy sunlight does not penetrate to the ground level so the plants at the ground level are unable to photosynthesize and eventually die back dense weak growth another issue overpopulation lack of nourishment high competition causing die back undecomposed leaf litter on the surface yes if the decomposition rate is very low again what will happen the soil will exhaust itself of all nourishment and the, since the metabolic or the decomposition rate is low that you know nourishment is not added to the top soil this will result in plant death frost drip drought grazing all these are possible causes of dieback okay so these are the effects of abiotic components on plants now we are looking into a particular type of plant insectivorous plants you have heard about the picture plant and all right venus flytrap all these are very very common insectivorous plants look into them please look into some examples of insectivorous plants in india okay you should be at least able to know the very common insectivorous plants in india google them plenty of you know them are available at least look into one or two of them okay just to know how, what they are and at least you know look into a picture of a couple of them you would be able to get an idea study the names of a couple of them from india okay so basically these plants are specialized in trapping insects 
okay but if you see cartoon and all you know you can see some plants eating human beings and animals that does not happen okay that happens only in cartoon network uh nowhere else okay so these are specialized in trapping insects okay and are broadly divided into two active and passive okay based on how they trap the spray insectivorous plants are divided into active plants and passive plants so active ones are the ones that actually close their leaves to trap the insect okay you might have seen some plants like uh say this okay so this sort of arrangements are there in certain kinds of plants so when the insects comes and sits inside this suddenly this will shut down okay so then similarly these sorts of plants are there you might have seen them correct when the insects comes and sits in between they simply close together these are all active ones because you can actually see that mo motion happening they suddenly shut uh, shut that you know uh, trap and the insect will get stuck inside that and it's digested passive ones they do not show that kind of a mechanism mechanical mechanism but instead these plants have pitfall mechanisms okay so here what happens is the insect you know once they come and sit on it they will slip and fall into it you know some kind of uh, liquid will be there which would either cause that in insect to you know stick to it or maybe slip and fall into the uh, you know structure where it gets digested okay so these are passive you can't see any mechanical motion but it is rather a trap okay so these are the two types of insectivorous plants but the question is why this sort of adaptation i mean plants are producers these insectivorous plants they are you know most of them are actually producers they are green plants then why do they have this sort of mechanism for nourishment that is the question first of all you know uh, these plants are you know very much colorful etc etc these basically have you know certain kinds of chemicals etc which attracts different insects uh, you know uh, uh, for their nourishment okay so very attractive features are very you know visible in these plants but what is the need for all this it is because the surrounding habitat or the climatic conditions are not enough for that plant to survive or for that plant to produce adequate food to survive usually these sort of plants are associated with heavily rain washed nutrient poor soils especially northeastern india and all high amount of rainfall okay and because of that intensive rainfall the soil nutrients are leached away very quickly so the plants are not able to get adequate nourishment from the soil in certain other cases we can see abundance of these plants in acidic soils wet and acidic areas which are very ill drained here what happens again the same thing they do not get adequate nutrition from the soil so they somehow have to find other means to have nourishment correct this is basically the reason why the plants have such mechanisms to trap insects when their basic nourishment features are not satisfied by the surrounding uh, ecosystem they have to go for adequate adapt <coughs> sorry adequate adaptation adaptive measures and these are the measures that are taken by such plants <coughs> all right now what are the threats faced by these plants very simple you can write it down yourself gardening trading for medicinal properties habitat destruction pollution prolific water weeds and invade you know other invasive species all these are very common points you can write it down yourself now another type of plants are the invasive alien species okay so what are these invasive alien species basically non native species in areas where the species have few or no natural predators all right so a species which is not native to a particular area 
which basically means coming from somewhere else. If that species is introduced into a, you know, a region, then there is a huge chance, there is a very high chance that there is no natural predator for that species, which means that species will start to multiply very fast and their population will increase at very rapid level because there is no predator species to control that population. These species are known as alien species. And if these alien species threaten the native species, then they are known as invasive species. Okay, if they threaten the natural or the native animals and plants, then they are known as invasive species. Okay, so they can be anything. They occur in all groups of plants and animals as competitors, predators, pathogens, parasites. They can be any of these. If they satisfy the initial two conditions, they are invasive alien species. Okay, so initially, when these species are arrived into the region, they tend to increase the species richness. Okay, I mean, a new species is being added to that ecosystem. So the species richness has temporarily increased. But once they start to multiply at very high rates, they will destroy the inherent or the native ecosystem. And then we can see a reduction in species richness. Okay, so initially, when these species are introduced, the species richness goes up and then it falls down. Okay. Now, what are the effects of invasive alien species on environment? First of all, loss of biodiversity and decline of native species. I already explained this. Habitat loss. Yeah. Introduction of uh, introduced pathogens reduce crop and stock yields. Yes. I told you some of these invasive species could actually be pathogens and pathogens are, you know, very good in affecting uh, crop yields. Okay. You can substantially reduce the crop yield. Then degradation of marine and freshwater ecosystems. Yeah, you have seen water hyacinth, correct? One of the best examples of invasive plant species is water hyacinth. If you put one of them in an aquatic region, within a week, you can see it filling the entire region. Okay, within a month, the entire water body would be green. Correct, very invasive, very high reproduction rate. The entire water aquatic ecosystem is gone for good. All right, now, these are the invasive alien species. Next topic, tree characteristics. Any questions? Nothing. So continuing, tree characteristics. So what are the different types of trees and what are the specific characteristics of the parts of different trees? Very simple. You might have studied this in your biology classes in upper primary standards. But just to refresh your memories. Okay, that's all. What are the different types of trees? The seediest, broadly, the seediest trees and evergreen trees. Okay, based on their shedding of the leaves, we can classify the trees as deciduous or evergreen. The seediest trees are those trees which will lose or which will shed their leaves at least once a year. At some point of time, mostly in temperate regions, the shedding happens in autumn climate and in the hot and dry regions such as tropics and you know subtropics this happens during summer season or the dry season such trees are known as deciduous trees evergreen trees are those that does not shed their leaves at any point of time in a year okay i mean occasionally even the, the old leaves will die out and they are replaced by new ones but at no point in time can you see an evergreen tree without any kind of leaves unless it is dead Got it. So this is the prime difference between deciduous and evergreen trees. Now talking about a tree, what are the different parts of a tree and what are its functions? Again, very rudimentary beginning things. Probably you studied this in your sixth or seventh standard. But anyway, let's refresh your memory very quickly. Roots. What, are, what, what is the purpose of a root? Keeping the tree from tipping over. Collection of water and nutrients. Correct. Also, to store them for times when they are, you know, uh, preserving for future use. Correct? All these are the functions of a root. What is the function of a crown? Crown means leaves and branches together, the top part of the tree. Produ uh, provides shade to the roots. Collects energy from the sun for photosynthesis. Removes extra water through transpiration. 
okay leaves leaves are basically the manufacturing units of plants converts energy into food correct so this food is either stored in the leaves itself or transported to branches or trunks or roots and after photosynthesis oxygen is released back into the atmosphere for branches branches are you know basically for the efficient distribution of the leaves okay so that the you know because of that distribution the they can maximize the uh, absorption of sunlight they are also conduits for water and nutrients from you know one part of the tree to other part just like a blood vessels then trunk provides shape to the tree support to the crown transports water and nutrients from the soil and uh, no, soil to the upper parts similarly from upper parts food is transported down to the roots so very basic functions all these you know but what are the parts of a trunk okay we know about trunk but what are the sub parts of a trunk this you might have studied in your high school sections i hope you remember first of all annual rings or annular rings basically these are growth rings correct but when you cut a trunk tree trunk you can see many circles inside that this determines the age of a tree correct so this is used to calculate dendrochronology which means the age of the tree similarly paleoclimatology by studying these annular rings you can actually study the historic climatic conditions okay size of the growth of the ring is determined by the environmental conditions this is how you can study the paleoclimatology because the size of that ring the growth of that ring all depends upon environmental conditions such as temperature water availability so and so okay so annular rings is a part of a trunk then bark the outer thick layer is known as bark the outer layer of the trunk okay basically it provides protection for the tree some of the bark are you very useful as say a medicinal you know it has medicinal properties some are used as spices okay so this bark is actually divided into two one is the inner bark and the other one is outer bark okay outer one provides all this protection and all inner bark also known as phloem you have heard about xylem and phloem right so the inner bark is basically the phloem this is made up of living cells and you know they are basically uh, say responsible for carrying sap full of sugar from the leaves to the rest of the tree so when the you know sugar production happens in the leaves it has to be transported to other parts of the tree correct this transportation happens through uh, phloem okay outer bark basically deals with protection they are dead dead cells okay they are not living cells they are dead cells they are on the only uh, agenda there is to give protection to the inner uh, tender areas of the tree okay then cambium or cambium however you want to produce it, uh, pronounce it what are what is a cambium this is actually a thin layer of living cells just inside the bark okay in i mean outermost layer is the bark we have inner bark and outer bark inside that right just inside that we have the cambium they are also living cells their property or their job is to make new cells allowing the tree to grow wider each year this is how a tree grow in thickness because the cambium produces more and more new new cells this increases the thickness of the stem got it now sapwood sapwood also known as xylem so network of living cells that bring water and nutrients up from the roots to the branches so phloem basically conducts all the sugar and food from leaves to the other parts of the plant xylem takes water and nutrients from roots to the other parts of the plant get it so xylem is basically a water conduit and phloem is basically a food conduit understood so over the years you know this uh, basically xylem is the youngest wood of the tree and over the years they will become very hard and they are known as hardwood okay so what is a hardwood hardwood means dead sapwood in the center of the trunk at the very center if you cut down a tree and if you cut that wood cross sectionally you can see that the most 
dark region is the center area of the bull. It is not in the side. Okay, it's actually at the center. Clear? This is the hardest wood of the tree, giving the tree its strength to stand against all odds. They are darker in color. Then comes pith. Pith is basically the tiny dark spot of spongy living cells right at the center of the tree trunk. You can see some you know tiny dark spots here and there at the middle okay at the center of the tree trunk you can't see it in the peripheries it's right at the center of the trunk this is known as a pith these are very important functions they have these are very important functions in carrying essential nutrients to different parts of the tree and because these are so vital for the life of a tree they are most protected Okay, from damage by insects, wind, animal, etc, etc. That is why they are right at the center of the trunk, not in the periphery. These are one of the most protected parts of a tree. Okay, now we are done with the uh, trunk. So now let's look into roots. Okay, this that's all. We are not going to look into any leaves or anything. Im important uh, area, roots. So broadly, roots are classified into three. Tap root, fibrous root, and adventitious roots. Tap root is basically the main root, the primary descending root that goes all the way down. Very you know prolongated radical. Okay, that you know. Lateral root means you know the fibrous roots, basically, or say not exactly fibrous root, but uh, the lateral branches that happen from the tap root. Okay, so if this is the tap root, then these are the lateral roots. Get it? Fibrous root means there is no tap root system. Directly, the roots will be like lateral roots. These are seen in grasses. Okay, tap root system is mostly seen in trees or say much more steadier plants for, uh, or say desert plants and all. All right. Now, third one is advantageous roots. So roots that are produced from the parts of the plant other than radical or its subdivision. So if the roots are produced from any other part of the plant, then such roots are known as adventitious roots. And these are of several types. No questions. So continuing. These are of several types. One is buttress. What are buttress? They are outgrowths formed usually vertically above the lateral roots and thus connect the base of the stem with the roots. So let me draw a diagram here. Okay. If this is a tree trunk, and this is the roots. Okay, these are the main roots. Then sometimes right at the base of the stem, you can see some more roots. Correct? Such roots are known as buttresses. Okay, they connect the base of the stem with the roots. Example, silk cotton tree, etc. etc. Then we have prop roots. What are prop roots? These are produced by the branches of the tree. Like a banyan tree. You know what are prop roots. Okay, so basically, if this is a banyan tree or say some other such massive trees, basically you have some hanging stuffs. Correct. These are known as prop roots. Initially they will be hanging. Finally they will reach the ground and they get fixed into the ground. Okay. Then stilt roots. What are stilt roots? Mostly seen in mangroves. I have already taken this during ecosystems. Okay. Remember terrestrial ecosystem mangroves, mangrove forest. Yeah, there I already told you what stilt roots are. Basically, emerge from the bud of a tree above the ground level. Okay, so for example, in mangrove areas where the water is fully salty, the root will rise up like spines into the air for absorbing oxygen. Such an adaptation is known as stilt root. Finally, pneumatophore. What are pneumatophores? Spike-like projections of the roots of the swamp or mangrove tree above the ground. Same. Okay. This is another adaptation again for absorbing oxygen in saline areas. Correct. So, stilt root and pneumatophores are seen in mangrove areas. Buttresses and prop roots are seen like everywhere. All right. Now, root types. Some more are there. Three more. Posterior roots. 
I explained what a hostorial root is earlier in this class. I hope you have noticed it. You have paid attention to it. Basically, these are seen in parasitic plants. These are the roots that are used by the parasitic plants in order to feed from the host tree. Okay, next one, storage roots. Some of the roots are modified as storage units. Carrots, beetroot. Okay, these are the examples. Radish. Then, mycorrhiza. My, what is a mycorrhiza? Structure produced from the combination of the modified rootlet with fungal tissue. It's a specific thing. Uh, when, you know, the root is modified along with the fungal tissue, it provides something known as, uh, it uh, develops into something known as a mycorrhiza. That is a spe you know, specific, not a type of a root or anything. It's one, you know, specific type of a root, a uh, uh, special character. It's not seen, it's not like it is seen everywhere. It itself is a spe uh, special uh, and, uh, adaptation. Okay, mycorrhiza. Basically, modified rootlet with fungal tissue. Now, some miscellaneous things. First of all, canopy classification. What exactly is a canopy? You know what is a canopy. Canopy basically means you know, say for example, if there are, there's a lot of trees here, okay, the top portion will itself act as a bed, thereby preventing any sort of sunlight from reaching the ground. So this is known as a canopy. Okay, in a rainforest and all, there could be multiple layers of canopy. So, there are different classifications of canopy. Closed canopy, it means density is perfect, 1.0. Not even a single ray of sunlight will come down. Perfect canopy. If the density is between 75% to 100%, then it is dense. If it is between 50 to 75%, then it is thin canopy. And if it is less than 50%, then it is known as open canopy. Okay, so uh, close canopy, dense canopy, thin canopy, and open canopy. Some random things that you can keep in mind. Not, uh, you know, there is no structure or anything here. Some random facts, but important. What is phenology? Phenology is the science that deals with the time of appearance of characteristic period, periodic events such as leaf shedding, etc. etc. So during a year, during the four seasons, certain characteristics become evident only during certain periods. Correct? So the science that deals with this periodic appearances of certain characteristics is known as phenology. Phenology. Okay, now, what is etiolation? With the absence of adequate light, plants become pale yellow and have long thin internodes. This is known as etiolation. This is also seen in dense canopy regions. Okay, because of the lack of sunlight, the leaves will start losing its color, uh, its green color and becomes pale yellow and will have long internodules and all. So this is internodes and all. So this is known as etiolation. Last one, autumn tint. In some trees, leaves undergo a striking change in color before falling from the tree. Best example, mango, mango tree. Before that leaf goes, you know, falls down, it turns yellow. Correct, mango tree leaf, it changes its color before it falls fall down. This is known as autumn tint. Taper. What is a taper? Taper is this you know, adaptation of a tree where the thickness of the trunk increases towards the bottom. And it is tapering towards the top. This actually is an adaptation. Why? In order to prevent the tree from falling down during heavy winds. If the tree trunk is like this, what will happen? The tree will not survive too long. If the tree trunk is this, this is also not such a good adaptation. But if the tree trunk is like this, it will have much, much, much more stability. Okay, so this is known as taper. Bamboo gregarious flowering. What is bamboo gregarious flowering? Some plants, which are usually not a flowering plant, they will flower right before they die. Okay. Generally, this is, you know, when this bamboo flowering happen, that plant will die right afterwards. This phenomenon is known as bamboo gregarious flowering. Usually, you know, uh, this is not uh, an annually flowering plant, but the flowering happens right before its death. 
it is a flowering plant obviously but it does not flower annually usually okay but once it flowers we can be more or less sure that that plant is about to die this very rare phenomenon is known as bamboo flowering what is aerial seeding very simple process of dispersing the seeds aerially okay this is a government you know, part of a government scheme also rather than you know putting the seeds uh, one by one sometimes you know uh, gliders or helicopters are used to sprinkle the seeds all over the area okay the aerial dispersing of the seeds this is known as aerial seeding this can be natural or artificial usually it is artificial human beings do this to seed a huge vast area okay so now a very small topic of also marine organisms we will finish this in 10 minutes maximum 10 minutes a okay, very small area no questions so continuing plankton everything you know okay we have already learned this so i will finish this before 9 15 okay plankton group of organisms which float on the surface of water so water bodies like rivers lakes oceans etc are known as planktons planktons are of two types phytoplanktons and zooplanktons all these are you know things we have already studied okay the locomotory power of the planktons are very limited why because they are very small so usually they flow with the water the current of the water the flowing pattern etc determines where the plankton go correct the growth rate productivity and species diversity of a plankton in tropical waters especially in the mangrove waters are very very high yes also correct okay in the tropical waters we can see a lot of you know huge number of uh, say planktons both zooplanktons and phytoplanktons coming to phytoplanktons what are phytoplanktons they are microscopic plant organisms that live in aquatic environments correct some are bacteria some are protists most are single celled plants they can be anything that could they could be bacteria they could be protists they could be single cell i mean most of them are single cell plants very microscopic in nature phytoplanktons produce more than 60 percent of oxygens produced from all plants very important we might think maximum oxygen is produced by you know terrestrial plants or something but it is actually the phytoplanktons that produce more than 60 percent of oxygen in the world every phytoplankton have chlorophyll Okay, and they can do photosynthesis and converts uh, this energy into chemical energy and, and stores it as food. Correct, and they are, these are visible in the euphotic region of a water body, which means the region where sunlight is up, available. Correct, and they are present in almost all parts of the world, including polar regions. If there is light, they are there. Okay, and their total biomass is many times greater than that of total plants on land and they serve as pasture grounds in aquatic environment yes their total biomass is much greater than terrestrial plants and they serve as pasture gra grounds for aquatic organisms what are the factors affecting phytoplankton biodiversity very simple you already know this we have already studied this first of all this point is very important Highest concentrations of phytoplanktons are found in high latitudes, not in the tropics or subtropics. Yeah, we have a lot here, but highest concentrations of them are seen in higher latitudes with the exception of upwelling areas of continental shelves. While the tropics and subtropics have 10 to 100 times lower concentrations. Okay, so most are seen in higher latitudes. Please keep that in mind. Very important. You might think it is other way, but actually most concentrations are seen in higher latitudes, especially because of the ocean currents and all. I told you they are moved here and there based on how the current flows. Then what are the factors affecting phytoplankton biodiversity? Light. I don't have to explain this. They are only seen in euphotic layers. Nutrients. Yes, mainly nitrogen and phosphorus. Okay, so nutrient are another factor that uh, determines the biodiversity temperature yeah rate of photosynthesis increases with increase in temperature but if the temperature is too much then photosynthesis you know cannot rise or it, it will start to decay salinity another factor grazing of you know grazing by zooplanktons 
So these are the factors that affect uh, the biodiversity of phytoplankton. What are zooplankton? Zooplankton are the microscopic animals. Correct. Just as phytoplankton are microscopic plants, zooplankton are microscopic animals which serve a very important role in aquatic food chain. You know all these things. So I am not spending too much time here. Okay, they are very much abundant in mangrove areas, etc. etc. Okay, the zooplankton determine the quantum of fish stock. So if the zooplankton availability is very high, you can find a lot of fishes there. So this, this is actually used by the you know, fishermen, etc. etc. to find areas where lots of fishes are available. Okay, now last two topics, seagrass and seaweed. What is seagrass? Marine flowering plants. Okay, flowering plants of angiosperms. So marine flowering plants that resembles grass in appearance grow in shallow coastal waters with sandy or muddy bottoms and require comparatively calm areas. These are known as seagrass. Basically, it looks like a grass, but it grows in aquatic ecosystem. That's all. They are flowering plants also. But the main point is, these are the only group of higher plants adapted to life in salt water. Only group of higher plants. Okay, uh, zooplankton are not higher plants. They are microscopic. So they are the lower plants. The only group of higher plants that are adapted to life in salt water are seagrass. Is seagrass, sorry. Okay, so what are their functions? They reduce the wave and current energy. Yes, they act as a barrier. They filter the suspended sediments and help them to settle down. Yes. Provides habitat for marine invertebrates and fishes. Yes. Nutrient sinks. Also correct. I don't have to explain any of these, correct? I mean, these are all self-explanatory points. Use logic. What are the threats faced by seagrass? Eutrophication, siltation, trawling. What is trawling? Deep sea fishing. Okay, you know the trawling, trawler boats and all, which are banned by government of India. So trawling is a threat to seagrass also. Coastal engineering constructions and over-exploitation. Simple points. These are the threats of seagrass. Last one. Seaweed. Seaweeds are basically macroscopic algae. Okay, there is no differentiation of true tissue such as roots, stems and leaves. There is no clear distinction of or any of these. Basically, these are, you know, some sort of appendages. That's it. There is no clear distinction between root, stem, leaves, etc, etc. These are found attached to rocks, corals, etc, etc. Okay, seaweeds are basically attached to coral reefs or say submerged rocks, uh, so and so. Based on the color of their pigmentation, seaweeds are broadly classified into different classes such as green, brown, red, blue, green, etc, etc. So a wide variety of colors are available. If you have seen some say, uh, what is it, deep sea diving, uh, you know, uh, video footages in your national geographic channel or discovery channel you would know what i am talking about they are uh, they are available in different colors and all especially you know attached to rocks and all under the sea okay so these are basically seaweeds what are their functions they provide food for marine organism they provide habitat for fish and they act as a source of sediment for various nutrients as well as say sand and other particles Okay, so this is it. This is it for today. Today we looked into some very random topics from here and there. Important in the sense that you can't, you know, you can't skip them. That is why I took this class anyway. There is no proper structure in today's class. I know that. But these topics are very important. Uh, and so you, you can't skip it for UPSC. So you have to study it anyway. So that's why I took it. Please, once again, I'm telling you, Make a list of the animals and plants and you know birds etc. in endangered and critically endangered species in India. Make a list of them and try to you know understand uh, where they are seen. Okay, their habitat and the states in which they are seen. That's enough. Okay, at least a couple of things about them. That's all. Alright, so please uh, make sure to like this video, subscribe to this channel and share with your friends. I will upload the entire lecture note in the telegram channel right away. So we will meet again on Monday. Okay, tomorrow there is no lecture. 
we will meet again on day after tomorrow so until then this is good night and bye bye